Assalamu alaikum and a very good day. I hope you people are keeping yourself and your mind in good shape. Uh, today we are going to talk uh, under the polity of ancient India, the classical India. We are going to talk about the economy. Uh, the, um, in classical India, the quest for wealth not only had social legitimacy, but had religious sanctions as well. And uh, spirituality is basically uh, commonly attributed to Indian culture, but at that point of time, the uh, physical mundane wealth was essential too, as it always has remained and will remain ever. The mode of the Aryans had undergone a gradual but fundamental change during the first thousand years of their life in India. And this basic change was in economics and transition from the chancy subsistence economy of nomadic pastoralism to the relatively secure surplus economy of a settled agrarian life. The expansion of agriculture was followed by the expansion of trade. This, this is natural. And this played a crucial role in the prosperity of the early classical age and had a transformative effect on Indian society and culture. Urbanization hastened and towns sprang up all over the Indo-Gangetic plain in the second half of the first millennium. For about 1000 years, from around the middle of the first millennium BCE to around the middle of the first millennium common era, India had enjoyed great prosperity. Typical of this uh, was that, that in Gupta period, the towns were not functioning as best as they were doing earlier. And this brought into a sorry state of affairs in the 7th century when there was no trade activity anywhere. The major reason for this commercial decline was the decline of India's trade with Europe following the collapse of the Roman Empire. But there were other reasons too, such as radical transformation of the ethos of Indian society, a passive and fatalism, a passive attitude and passive fatalism inculcated by Hinduism gradually replaced the earlier spirit of self-reliance and enterprise inculcated by Buddhism and Jainism. The orthodox Brahmanical view held all productive occupations and caste in disdain and this too had a very detrimental effect on the economy and as property declined, uh, as prosperity declined, so did the Indian culture. Culture is very much joined with the economic well-being. Uh, but this cycle of progress and decline was not uniform everywhere in India because of the large size and diversity of the country. By the end of the first millennium common era, economy had slumped everywhere in India. However, despite this, the gold Greco-Roman perception of India as a land of fabulous riches persisted in Europe for several centuries. The transformation of Aryan society in India began with the conversion of the early Aryan pastoral economy into an agrarian economy in relatively uh, later Vedic period. This, the farmer, though himself an artless rustic, was the harbinger of civilization because he produced and the production gave money. All the cultural activities of society depended on the, 
on the productivity of the farmers. It was in the Indus Valley that Aryans in India first took to settled farming. Initially, all the advances they made were confined to uh, endogangetic plain. In contrast, conditions in contemporary peninsular India were quite backward. Even after the introduction of plough agriculture, peninsular India remained mostly a sparsely populated wilderness for many centuries. Even six centuries later, vast tracts of the peninsula were still inhospitable and cultivated areas were very few. Meanwhile, the North Indian economy had surged ahead. There was a major spurt there in villages, settlements and agricultural expansion during the Gupta period. There was also a pressing need for kings to expand cultivation, to garner increased revenue to meet their growing administrative and military expenses, the cost of ruling a place. Another means adopted by the kings to expand cultivation was to give land grants in hinterlands initially to Buddhist and Jain monasteries, later to Hindu temples and Brahmins and still later to royal officers as well. These uh, land grants, apart from bringing new lands under cultivation, also helped to propagate advanced farming techniques. Brahmins in particular, as one very renowned uh, historian of India, Kusambi, observes were modernizing colonizers who introduced plough agriculture, new crops and better cattle breeding practice to the outlook of the people and spread among them the knowledge of distant markets. So the Vedic uh, Aryan practice of cutting down and burning in the forest to claim it for cultivation suited well the martial spirit of Aryans. In early times, farming was mainly a subsistence activity and most land holdings were small, what a family could cultivate by themselves to produce what they needed and to feed themselves and to procure their minimal necessities. Monasteries and temples also provided agriculture finance usually to village assemblies, but sometimes to individual farmers as well. This was like a financial grant to a farmer. As agriculture became well established, farming knowledge was confided and codified by scholars like uh, Varahamihira Hira, the 6th century polymath in his encyclopedic, I'm sorry for this, it's like a tongue twister. He, he gave detailed instructions of farming techniques. In classical times, two principal harvests were normally gathered in India in summer and autumn, and sometimes also a minor crop in spring. The primary cereal of early Aryans was barley, but they took to rice soon after arriving in India, though there is no mention of rice at all in Rig Veda, both Atharveda and Yajurveda extol it. Barley and rice are healing balms, the sons of heaven of ne who never die. This was in Atharveda mentioned. Among the many varieties of rice grown in classical India, the rarest and most highly valued rice was Mahasali, which according to Huan Sang, was as large as the black bean and when cooked is aromatic and shining like no other rice at all. Called the rice of the grandees, Mahasali grew in Bihar, Magadha, its old name, and was offered only to the kings or to the religious persons of great distinction. I think Basmati comes from that generation also. Indian texts place great emphasis on the tonic value of rice, regarding it as having excellent nutritional and restorative properties. These and other 
uh, the, the rice and barley and other similar produce made India famed in the ancient world as the land of medicinal plants and aromatics. Mango, which India uh, proudly claims to be the king of fruits, was also extend, extensively cultivated in classical times. And it was the friar Jor Jordanus wrote that this fru fruit is so sweet and delicious that it is impossible to praise the mangoes or impossible to express in words. Another unique and wondrous produce of India in the eyes of foreigners was sugar cane. So sir, and they, the Europeans were calling it a sweet bamboo. Certain wild trees there bear wool instead of fruit and that is beauty and quality excel that of sheep and Indian make their clothing from these trees. These were the silk, silk worms. And the most um, valuable produce of India were saffron from Kashmir and spices from Kerala. So the Jataka stories, they state that pot herbs, pumpkins, goods, cucumbers and other vegetables were commonly grown by the home gardener. Second thing was cattle rearing, though in economic importance has considerably diminished in the classical age was still practiced extensively in the country side. So the dairy farming has not died, though it, the uh, activity has lessened. Indian rivers were rich in fish and fishing was a peripheral economic activity in classic India. And this uh, fish, white jade, fine pearls are the natural products of the country. There is beside these an abundance of rare gems and various kinds of precious stones with different name. Huan Sang wrote. Farming in India in classical times <clears throat> as indeed even in modern times were largely monsoon despondent, uh, monsoon um, despondent and dependent also, but had astrologers serving as weather forecasters predicting the unpredictable on the basis of omens, portents and as astronomical data. The technology for building um, irrigation system was well developed in classical India and the management of water resources well organized. So they were better than us, what we are today. The management of water resources was so crucial a requirement for agriculture that lawgivers like Kautilya and Manu prescribed extreme penalties for those who damaged water works. In villages, the distribution of water to individual fields from the common irrigation system was overseen by a special committee and those who drew excess water were charged for that. When our, um, we are in Pakistan, the land is irrigated by canals, this system of water distribution exists. <clears throat> Most of the irrigation works in classical India were small and built by the local people, but there were also a few major reservoirs built and maintained by the state. The largest of them was Sudarshana Lake, meaning beautiful lake, on the Ginner Hill in Gujarat. Ginner Hill on Gujarat, this is the Junagar now. And it was built by Chandragupta Maurya. The a question of building dams, because uh, the embankment on the lake were severely damaged in rainstorms. Despite all these advances in agriculture, land by itself was not considered an economic asset in ancient classical India. Most land holdings in classical India were small and family cultivated. The use of hired labor for cultivation had become so common in classical time that the law books found it necessary to prescribe the norms for farm wages. 
An important development of pattern of land holding in classical India was the gradual emergence of monasteries, temples and Brahmans uh, as possessors of large estates. In the late Gupta age, farming was mainly in the hands of Shudras, but this was a new development. The socio-economic uh, changes were reflected in changes in the population profiles of villages. The early classical Indian villages had a good amount of homogeneity in population. They were essentially clan habitats, the main groups of belonging to the same caste. Similarly, is the famine scene described by Dendin in the Sakumara Charita, which though fiction has the clear ring of reality, in those days Indra gave no rain for 12 years. The corn withered, the plants yielded no produce, the trees grow no fruit and the clouds were sterile. Streams dried up, ponds turned into mere mud holes and a spring ceased to follow. Bulb, roots and fruits became scarce. So this could be seen that the agrarian economy was badly hit by famine. Khudafis.